Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Christy Nuds. I am the editor of Food in Canada, Canada's only national food and beverage processing magazine. On behalf of Food in Canada and the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology, welcome to Table Talks, where we bring you regular webinars that give you access to some of the leaders in the food and beverage industry. If you haven't already, please visit CIFST's website for a list of upcoming webinars, which will continue weekly into July. If you are a member of CIFST, registration for the entire webinar series is free. Today's topic is value chain, chain management, a path to Canadian food innovation and lessons from around the globe. Our speaker is Simon Samoji, Errol Chair in the Business of Food at the University of Guelph Value Chain Management. Before we kick off today's session, I want to mention that if you have any questions, you can rate them in the question box. I will be moderating any questions at the end of end and our speaker will attempt to answer them before the end of the webinar. And I'd like to now introduce our speaker. Dr. Simon Samoji is the Errol, Errol Chair in the Business of Food and Director of the Longos Food Retail Laboratory in the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management and an Honorary Senior Fellow in Agribusiness in the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences, University of Queensland in Australia. He has a PhD in agribusiness marketing from the University of Adelaide, Australia, and he is a teacher and researcher in the area of agri-food value chain management and international market development. Please welcome Dr. Simon Samoji. Well, uh, thank you, Christy. Um, yes, uh, it's great to be uh, here with you all today. I'm really excited about the, the presentation and opportunity to talk about uh, the work that uh, I've been doing uh, over the last well, sort of 15 years of my life in this area of uh, food, well, agri-food value chains. And I'll talk about what that is, um, and I'll talk about why I think it's important to Canadian food uh, innovation. Uh, and I think the best way to sort of explain what it is is to show a lot of examples um, from the research that I've done um, around the world. And yeah, we'll, we'll finish with uh, some questions. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. As you can tell from my voice, I'm not originally from uh, Canada. I'm originally from Australia and uh, I did most of my education uh, in, in Australia. Uh, my PhD was at the University of Adelaide and worked a number of uh, academic institutions in Australia before coming uh, to work at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia for a few years. Uh, and for the last two years, I've been at the University of Guelph, where I hold, uh, as, as Christy said, the Errol Chair in the Business of Food. Uh, and, you know, over the, the span of my career, I've done a lot of uh, many research and development uh, projects and also consultancy in numerous countries around the world, particularly in, in Southeast Asia, uh, parts of Africa, obviously uh, in Canada as well. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about value chains, um, but I think before I start talking about that, it's important to sort of give some context about why I research value chains. And I think some of the reason for it sort of stems from what I call my research philosophy. And, and there's a few angles to that. So I think the first angle is this idea that making more food doesn't mean that more people will get fed. It's, it's going to be something that people want to eat, uh, it's going to be something that's you know nutritious, that's good for them and it's culturally appropriate for them, um, but they want to pay some maybe more money for. Um, so more food doesn't mean more people get fed. More food doesn't equal more money. It's basic market economics say if you flood a product, sorry, flood a market with product, uh, the price drops uh, and that means lower returns for everyone in the market. Obviously that's good for consumers, but not good for the businesses that, that make uh, food. Um, pardon me, the last one, you know, food isn't made by people, it's made by people running businesses. And as passionate as those people are about the food they make and where they make it and how they make it and the communities they're involved with that make that food, no profit uh, means no food. So the whole food system has to be profitable. So along those three areas, you can think, well, okay, understand, you know, consumers are important. The businesses that make the food are important. Uh, so, and those businesses in food exist in these sort of relationships between each other in the buying and selling of the products that they, they make. So I focus on consumer behavior. I focus on the, the, the chain processes that happen uh, in those food supply chains. And my work has particularly been in what I would call the higher value 
uh, segments of the of the agri-food market. So wine, the seafood sectors, uh, fruit and vegetables, less of say the oil seeds, grains, where the buying and selling and the consumer behavior is a bit different because there tend to be ingredients that go into other products um, and uh, the connection with the consumer is a little bit less for say. So this idea of value chains and value chain management fits within that. And I'll just spend a couple of slides explaining what I mean by value chains uh, and an analysis around that. So the term value chain gets used a lot. It's sort of almost a, a synonym for a supply chain, but it is different and it, it's different because of a philosophy. So in its most simplest sense, it's a group of organizations that take a product from inputs, say for example, seeds and seedlings through to primary production, processing, uh, retailing all the way to consumption, which is the same as a supply chain, but value chain management is a bit different. Uh, it's a business approach. It's a business philosophy. It's where firms look at how they run their business. They, they look at how they can run it efficiently and effectively, not only how they run their business, but also looking at how you can make that connection between the business they buy from or the business they sell to a, a lot closer. Um, so it, it's about, they work together. Um, but they're focused on one thing and they're focused on delivering what the consumer wants. Uh, so how does this really differ from a supply chain? So the best way to explain it is through this, these two photos and, or sorry, these two illustrations. And uh, these ones are, are based on sort of supply chains for wine. So you can see there's a person holding some seedlings and, and a grape grower and then someone who makes the wine and a retailer or a restaurant and then a consumer. So in a supply chain philosophy, each member of the chain does something to the product. So a, a seedling producer produces seedlings, they then sell them to a farmer who then grows the grapes, they then push that product on to the, to the winemaker who then makes a wine out of it, who then pushes the product on to a retailer or, or a restaurant or whoever it may be that sells it to an end consumer. There's no thought that's gone into that product about what the consumer wants. It's not informed by the consumer. So everyone's just pushing the product. What they, they do their thing and then they push it to the next level of the chain and so on and so forth. It's, it's not a good way of running a chain. Um, you end up having product that's not sold. You can see the, the lady in the top right hand corner. She's got a glass in the air and she doesn't look very happy. It's, it's not really informed by what, what that person wants. So it's, it's what I call a sick value chain. Um, you end up having yeah, product that's not sold, bottlenecks, waste, inefficiency. In the value chain model, it's a bit different. So businesses in, in that chain will come together. Uh, they might even do some research on what that consumer wants and, and give that information to all members of the chain, whether they be this, the seedling producer, primary producer, all the way through the chain. Each member of the chain then theoretically has a better idea of what they need to be doing to deliver what that consumer wants. Uh, and therefore they end up making something that the consumer wants. So the, you can almost say that the consumer is pulling uh, the product through the chain. So less push, more pull, less inefficiency, uh, more focus on the consumer, better outcomes for all. Typically more product gets sold at a higher price point as well. So here in that supply chain model, you, yeah, as I said, you don't really know what the consumer wants. You sort of, in each level of that chain, you're basically doing something to the product, either growing it or processing it, and then you're taking that product, whatever the attributes of that product are, you're bundling it with cost, putting on some margin and trying to then push it off to the next member of the chain to buy. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a good way of doing business. It, it's not sustainable. Um, and the, the best way is, well, I should say that if you ever look at the top left-hand illustration, you know, it's typical in agri-food chains, everyone's competing. Everyone wants to get that piece of the pie. Um, but, you know, competing for your slice is is not a good thing. It, it, it doesn't lend itself to long-term success of your own individual business or businesses in the chains. Uh, on the right, uh, I've put in this picture of a, well, what is effectively a chain for a, uh, a grain. Um, and you can see how working, rather than trying to compete for the piece of pie, we'll actually look at growing the pie, working together, focusing on the market, focusing on consumers. It means that your piece of the pie 
gets better, it gets bigger, uh, rather than just trying to take bits of pieces of that pie uh, from other members in the chain. Uh, what I also like looking at that picture or illustration on the right is that you can see how each segment is a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. And when I, when I talk, probably the people that are in the, in the farming community, uh, this is really important to them because they always look and hear, you know, they go to a grocery store and maybe they, they're a farmer that, that grows blueberries and they sell their blueberries for 20 cents a pound, but then they see the retailer uh, selling it to the consumer for $3 a pound. And then the first thing they say is, you know, how unfair that is and, you know, the retailer's doing all, making all the money and we're making nothing. Um, there's a lot of disconnect in that sort of supply chain. There's a little understanding about what's happening. Um, I think the important thing to remember, and this is a little bit off the topic from value chains, is that the three most expensive things a business in a food supply chain can do is to employ people, to move products, so logistics, trucking, shipping, and the third thing is to refrigerate product. Uh, so if you look at the a typical food supply chain, the retailer and, and the processor typically do all those three things, or well, they do a lot of those three things. So typically their cost structures are higher and their margins are high and they and therefore typically get more of that margin. Um, so I, I think in more corporate businesses and, and more sophisticated supply chains, that's understood, but uh, yeah, something I always like to explain to people that, you know, retailing is an expensive business. And as we've seen recently with what happened with COVID, we've seen some of the major retailers taking some flack for uh, rescinding their uh, hero pay or their increased pay for workers. You know, uh, they've incurred, all, they've made making money over COVID. There's no question about that, but they've been incurring huge costs. And in the food business, margins are slim. So any greater costs uh, has to be borne by someone. And sometimes uh, you've got to look at those costs in a different way and work out how you can figure them out. Anyway, so yeah, working together rather than competing grows the pie rather than you're trying to fight for your piece or a bigger piece. So if you, if you look at supply chains worldwide for a whole bunch of different products, this idea of working together, being efficient, uh, focusing on the end market has been the case forever. If you look at the automotive sector, uh, companies such as, you know, Toyota and the way that uh, you know, they engage with their suppliers. They, you know, they're usually big suppliers. They're typically very close relationships. They have just-in-time systems to get products or get supplies to their manufacturing plants on time. But on the other end of the spectrum is businesses in agri-food chains. Um, so by agri-food chain, I should mention, and maybe that might have led to some confusion. By agri-food chain, I'm talking about a food chain. I'm talking about a chain that involves primary production, processing, uh, retailing in all its forms. Um, you could call it a food supply chain, you could call it an agri-food value chain, sometimes the wording gets a bit complicated. But in agri-food chains there's a lot of entities, typically there are, you know, as I've shown in, that, in those illustrations before, there can be five or six different businesses um, and the, the nature of those businesses are very different. Typically down the end of the chain at the retailing and wholesaling end, they're very sophisticated businesses, they're corporatized, uh, you know, they're, they're big companies. Uh, and they have sophisticated business systems and corporate ethos. While, you know, farms typically, and this is not a case for all, but typically are small businesses, um, historically families, um, different ways of running businesses. Um, if you then look at the same levels of chains, you know, historically a lot of, has been a lot of animosity between members of chains, farming communities that are small and historical. Other farmers don't like other farmers. There's this unwillingness to cooperate. Uh, and particularly if we were talking about farming, you know, uh, farming is uh, 365 day a year or years, uh, you know, uh, sorry, day a year business, you know, it runs 24 hours a day, it involves a very small number of people. Um, they don't necessarily have the mindset to, to have the, the most up-to-date corporate business skills. Uh, that would be typical in a, in a more sophisticated business um, or the ability to, to look at new markets to understand what other members of the chain are doing, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so this idea of value chains has been uh, taken a little bit longer uh, in the agri-food sector. Right, so we talked about supply chains and value chains. So there's, of course, not a direct 
distinction between the two. I'll try to outline that. But all businesses sort of sit on a continuum to being very much focused on that whole idea of the value chain and very much focused on that push supply chain. So they sort of exist on a continuum. But what we do is we say, okay, let's do some research to find out where you sit and how we can make you better. And that's what I do in what I call value chain analysis. So I'll explain what value chain analysis actually is. So we do three things. Um, we analyze the flow of product or material all the way from input supply, seedlings, genetics, all the way down to fire, fire, final consumption. We look at what happens at each level of the chain. We also look at what happens between members of the chain as well. At the same time, we'll do some consumer research. We'll understand what the consumer may want in a particular product. Um, and we'll then we'll look at how we can then, how that information then flows back up the chain to, the, to all members of the chain. Does it go to some members of the chain about what the consumer wants or to all? Typically in most supply chains, it's usually held at the more retail, wholesale, but closer to the consumer end, um, which isn't great. Uh, and we also look at the money flowing the chain, through the chain in some projects. Um, we also look at the relationships, the, the building blocks of any relationships. And this is not just for business, and, but there's a business theory behind this, but it is trust and commitment. I think if you've, if you've got a partner or a husband or wife, you'll know that without trust and commitment, you don't have much of a relationships. So we, we, we try to understand that and the, how that works within the chain. So once you understand how the product flows, look at does it consumer information flow through the chain properly? How does the finance flow? What are the relationship likes? So we can come up with in interventions. So that's the basis of what I do in value chain analysis and management. And, and for the rest of my talk, I'm going to go through a, a, a number of examples from my research that explain this method. Uh, and, and the value of it. Why, so why is it important? So many of you may have seen the Barton report. Uh, it came out and said a few years ago that we needed to export $85 billion worth of agri-food products uh, by 2025. There's been some recent reports, uh, from the, particularly from the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, that says we're not going to make it to 85 million. Uh, COVID issues aside, we're just not going to make that. Now, Canada is a great agri-food producer. Its primary production, its farming is world-class, but what it misses is a strong food manufacturing sector. Uh, part of that is a food value-adding sector, and that's where the value is. That's where the money is, particularly in, in export markets. So I don't think that we're gonna get to 85 billion in exports in 2025 or 27 or 20 or, or 30 by producing more food. It's gonna be about producing more food that people want uh, rather than just being an ingredient producer that we, we typically are in Canada. We, we're excellent at, at uh, making primary production, as I said. Right, so we talked about different things that happen at each level of the chain and how we look at that. I'll go through a little bit of theory. I'm not gonna make it too, too boring because that's not what you want over your lunch but we look at three types of activities at each business and you can basically put them in these three things so you have these activities that lead to what a consumer wants they're evaluating branding and processing uh, then you have a whole bunch of activities that you have to do it's no choice you've got to unpack the product you've got to then put it on a truck you've got a marketing department a hr department a lot of those activities don't directly relate to adding value to the product or giving the consumer what they want, but you've got to do it. Then you have a whole bunch of activities that are wasted. All those things you can see there, defects, transport, you know, overproduction, inappropriate processing. So some people say, going to this slide here, there's this idea of lean management or ERP, Enterprise Resource Plan, uh, which typically will look at the processes in a business and make it more efficient, which if we look at the, the the uh, diagram on the right, it's really about taking all those activities and squeezing them, make, getting rid of the stuff that isn't good. Um, I don't think lean, lean management is extremely important if it's fo focusing activities based on what the market values. So if you can see on the right hand side, in the value chain ideal, you want to make the chain more efficient, more effective by, by focusing on those activities that are more value adding reducing those waste activities and you know okay those those activities that don't add value you've got to do anyway uh, so you know 
focusing on the consumer, but also being lean at the same time. Some of those ERP processes do that. Some of them aren't so great at doing that. Um, but just trying to explain that what, why I focus more on that consumer angle, um, because it's an important part of really making the, the chain more efficient rather than just making everything uh, lean. Right, so let's go into some examples because that's more interesting. So this is a project that I did uh, in Australia with some colleagues back uh, yeah, in 2014, so six years ago. Uh, time flies very quickly. Uh, this was for a company called One Harvest. One Harvest has the PBR or PVR, depending on what you call that. It's a plant breeder right or plant variety right. So they have the right, or they have purchased the right to sell a type of mango called a Calypso mango. It's a mango that's been bred based on what the consumer wants. So it's a slightly smaller mango than we would typically get from, say, Central America or in the Caribbean in Canada. Uh, it has a reddish hue. Uh, the stone in the fruit is smaller uh, and the flesh is sweet, uh, less acidic and less stringy. So it's been bred that way uh, because they realise that's what consumers want in a mango. So One Harvest has the right to license growers to grow that mango. And those, those growers have to supply One Harvest with that mango. They can't sell them anywhere else. So it's a, a very much of a proprietary, sorry, a proprietary chain. So we did the value chain analysis for them. So if you go to where the consumer part is, you can see these are all the activities that, sorry, these are the attributes that consumers are willing to pay money for or what they value. So you can see price is important to consumers, taste, brand. Interestingly, the color in our research wasn't important. I would have thought the red color was important, but not so. Uh, the size of the seed and overall appearance. And without going through it all, effectively what happens in this chain is, yeah, there's a company that provides mango seedlings that are grown into mango trees by growers who then grow mangoes. Mangoes, if you don't know, are picked unripe. They're picked green and then they're ripened in modified atmospheres. Uh, they then go to a receivable wholesale entity owned by the One Harvest Company and then on to retailers and then consumers. The boxes down the bottom are the interesting part because they show all those activities that we talked about in the previous slide and whether or not they are valuating or not valuating or waste. So you can see at some angles, let's go to the ripening house, You know, the sorting and grading that they do, the branding, the packaging. All these activities add value, while some of the other things don't, or there's just waste. So based on our mapping, you could say to the ripening and packing house, okay, these are the things you need to be focusing on. These are the wasted activities, which for privacy sake, I haven't added because they are very specific to this company. Um, but yeah, focus on these, focus less on these, uh, because these are gonna give you better mangoes that people are gonna buy more of and pay more money for. So yeah, that's across the whole chain. We also map, is the word I use, what happens at each level of the chain. So in this case, you have, um, I'm not gonna read through it all, but mangoes are picked unripe, uh, they're sorted by people, they're then labeled, um, they're, they're stacked, and then they're ripening and ripening sheds, and then out they go to different markets. So we do this at each level of the chain so we can understand what's happening and then we can uh, take all that information to those companies and based on that say, okay, maybe you're spending too much time washing or labeling or your ripening isn't right, all those sort of things. Right, so let's go to another example. This is a little bit closer to home. Uh, you may recall I, I worked uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia at, at Dalhousie University for a number of years. Uh, and I had a project that was sponsored by the provincial government to look at the shellfish export value chain to China. So the three major shellfish species uh, in Nova Scotia, which is the largest Canadian exporter of fish and seafood, are, are crab, uh, scallop and uh, lobster. Most of that is sent to the US, uh, but increasingly the Chinese market has become more important. I think that the statistic was in 2005 Nova Scotia was exporting one million dollars worth of uh, shellfish to China. Now it's, well, in 2000, 2017, it was $387 million worth. Uh, in fact, before COVID happened, it was over 400 million. Uh, 
the provincial government has a good understanding of how the chain works in Nova Scotia, so that the primary production, the harvesting, but very little about the Chinese chain. Uh, so we came in and did a study. So we wanted to understand what Chinese consumers wanted. Uh, we did our value chain analysis as well. I'll run you through some of those results. So we wanted to focus on the part of the Chinese chain that was important to Chinese consumers. And by doing some consumer research in, in those three cities of Beijing, Guangzhou and Chongqing, we found that seafood markets and restaurants was the place that they consumed most of their shellfish. So when we did our analysis and our interviews, we went to those members of the, of the chain. Uh, part of the study was also to feed into provincial promotion programs. So the, the province wanted to uh, look at um, promoting lobster in particular, and they didn't really know what wording to use on uh, in their promotional material, in their branding material. So we did a simple question in our survey about well, what, what, what words do you associate with lobster? Um, we would have never have guessed that umami and delicious and protein were some of the more Im, uh, important uh, words. So they, the, the provincial government used them uh, in their advertising campaign. So yeah. Right, so you may recall from the mango example or even looking at the overall, that first picture where I explained the difference between supply chains and value chains, that it's all very ordered and simple, but supply chains are very, very unusual and they're never like that. Now, product goes everywhere. So this basically gives you an overview of what the, the shellfish chain from Nova Scotia, China looks like. Put it simply, and I'll run through it, a harvester goes out in, his or her or their boats, puts the uh, the traps in the water, they then catch the lobster, take them to a wharf where a buyer will take that product and then sell it to a live shipper that is still part of Canada. That live shipper will then find a Chinese importer to sell the lobster, or this is called, let's use lobster as an example. We'll, we'll then find an importer for that lobster. The clearance company takes care of the paperwork, um, finance and uh, any customs uh, import duties. Then the importer will sell it to various areas. They'll sell it either directly to a local retailer, to a, directly to a restaurant, or typically to a seafood market. At that seafood market, then local restaurants, cons even consumers will come and, and buy that lobster. But there are also resellers who will go to those wholesale markets, get the lobster, and then take them to another city, and then sell it on to another wholesale market, and so on and so forth. So this is quite an interesting chain for those interested in supply chains because it can have up to seven or eight different entities or businesses touch or take a title to the product. And this is an extremely uh, fragile product. You know, from when it's uh, taken at the live shipper to when it needs to get to the seafood market, it, maximum is 48 hours. Otherwise, the product slowly starts to die and uh, that's not good. And that huge waste occurs and lowers price uh, and that's not what anyone wants. So quite a convoluted chain uh, for a very, very fragile product. So yeah, we went to the main markets of Guangzhou and Shanghai, interviewed restaurants, wholesalers, the clearance companies. Um, pr product form was interesting. So we obviously look at what type of products they want. Live is obviously the highest value. Uh, frozen, which is typically frozen in Canada, uh, second. And then there's a product which is a bit controversial, which is fresh frozen. So that's product that has subsequently uh, uh, died on way to market. Before it has enough time to perish, it's frozen. Uh, it's then typically used in soups as a flavorant. Uh, in Canada, that wouldn't be based on our food safety regulations. It wouldn't be legal, uh, but okay there. Um, so yeah, there is this opportunity there for fresh frozen. It's an extremely low value market, but obviously most of the attention is on, on the live market. Uh, yeah, the, the seafood markets in Guangzhou and Shanghai are quite a sight to behold. Uh, the, you know, the one in, in Shanghai is new, it's 37 acres, it's like a city. Um, and and you know, they do you know, hundreds of thousands of tons per year. So quite an eye-opening experience. So a few results. Um, people sometimes say that China is an emerging market for food or any products. That, in my mind, has to be the case for at least a decade. 
Uh, China is a very sophisticated market. There is a huge number, a huge amount of competition. And in, in the shellfish game, there is particular competition from other countries in Asia, in, in Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, so you've really, you know, there's a long term, and there's already long term relationships that those countries have with that market, even before Canada has been there. Uh, so Canada isn't the top ranked product, um, particularly when it comes to things like lobster, the Australian lobster, the uh, interesting the US lobster, which is almost exactly the same species. In fact, it is exactly the same species, I should say, um, gets a higher price point. Now, and you can ask me why uh, later on. Uh, since the Chinese government cut down on corruption, uh, there's less money, particularly for high-end restaurants uh, to sell, you know, expensive lobster dishes. So more of a change to value for money uh, products. The product quality issues are uh, an issue for, for Nova Scotia in particular. Uh, I talked about that mortality rate and, you know, 48 hours you've got. So really making sure that you get the product right. So we found that uh, the, the Chinese consumer wants a one to one and a quarter pound lobster. Uh, making sure that it gets the market quickly is really important. As I said, lots of competition for different types of shellfish, but we found one. So this just has a more of an interesting food science angle. So uh, yeah, massive competition, except for scallop. Uh, most of the scallop consumed in, in China is Chinese. And that is because the Chinese consumer on the Chinese restaurant in particular wants to cook the lobster live. So they want it on the shell. So typically lobster is caught in Canada it's dredged off the seabed, it's then um, frozen in a boat, um, but they want it live and they want it to send to market life. Now the current CFIA regulations say that that's the only way that you can process a scallop, you can't have them live. Um, well, that's my understanding and that was a, a couple of years ago, so it may have changed since because of the work maybe that's related to what we did for this project and that we said to the provincial government, hey, there's an opportunity that if you can work out a way to depurate a scallop, and send it live to China, there is a massive market to the point where they would spend five or $10 at the wholesale level to buy one scallop. Um, so we gave that information to the harvesters and to the provincial government, and I believe there's been some work um, on that issue to date. Um, some of the, the charts down below, um, I'm not gonna go through them all, but I think the important po point that to, to recognize out of them is that when it comes to higher value products, and remember value isn't just about the price of the product, it's about what consumers are willing to pay for, whether it's the color or the, or the taste or, or the brand. What they want is really what the, the wholesalers want or the restaurants want. And, and in this case, they want quality. So price is not the number one issue for wholesalers and buyers in that chain. Uh, it's important and credit terms and price is important, but not the number one, uh, attribute. Uh, so if you can guarantee quality, in my experience, then you can you can really demand a price and you can have a long, longer term relationship. Maybe, maybe demand is a bit of a strong term, but you can really influence the price that, that you get. I, the, the wording I use that if you can supply, as a supplier, if you can supply in full on time to the specifications of your customer or consumer, you'll always have a buyer. So it's just important um, uh, to note that. Right, and I'll finish off my talk with another example. Uh, this one's an interesting one because uh, a few years ago, almost 10 years ago now, uh, in Australia, I was approached, approached by a group of farmers. Excuse me. Uh, they were broccoli farmers, and they were in a, an area of production called the Lockyer Valley. It's in the state of Queensland, um, about an hour's drive from the capital of Brisbane. They had heard through their networks and on the grapevine, so to speak, that broccoli for Singapore in Singapore sells for twelve to fourteen dollars a kilogram. We're in Australia, typical to Canada, it's sort of a two to three dollar um, kilogram uh, price. So they were thinking, okay, wow, so is this a lucrative market? Um, so they came to me and said, okay, Simon, we'd like to find out, you know, about this chain. We want to know who's involved and what they do and, you know, what rewards, what money did they get? And, and you know, what's the market specification? What's important in that chain? So um, actually this, this project actually involved some undergraduate students and we went to Singapore and did the research and I'll, I'll go through what we found. So. What I find interesting about this chain is that it's a 24-hour chain. 
I'll explain what I mean by that. So here we have growers at one end and it's a hot country. So typically vegetables are picked at say four or five o'clock in the morning in the dark. Uh, they then go to a packing shed where they are then packed sort of in, well, they, they will probably use vacuum chillers to chill the product and pack it. Uh, it will then go to the Australian port. At, let's say at seven o'clock in the morning, it hits the packer. At, it'll get to the Australian port, which is the Brisbane airport. It'll get onto the 11 o'clock Qantas flight 51, I think it is, from Brisbane to Singapore, uh, which is about a seven, eight hour flight to then arrive in Singapore in their time at about 4 p.m. that same day in the afternoon. Uh, Singapore Airport Customs is pretty quick, so the importer comes with their truck and picks up that broccoli at say 6, 7 p.m., probably a little bit earlier, uh, and puts it in their refrigerated warehouse. Uh, they will then um, take it to uh, the retailer in overnight, where it will be packed overnight, so that at say 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, a consumer in Singapore can buy that product. So 24 hours from pick to consumer buying it. So very rapid, very quick, uh, a long distance. So to this point, I haven't really talked about information or, or finance flows and chains. And I'm gonna run you through a, an example of the money and how it works in this chain. The important thing to look at firstly is this figure here, $4.10. That is what the Chinese, or sorry, the Singapore importer, I might go back to that. So this person here, the Singapore importer, this is what they buy the product for. And if you break it down by the grower, you know, it gets about half of that, which is pretty good. The packer a little bit, uh, there's an exporter that makes the connection between the grower and the importer. Freight's expensive, obviously it's airplanes and that's uh, an expensive way of moving product and the port takes a little, a little bit of money. So $4.10 a kilogram. We wanted to find out what the importer's margins are and the retailer's margins are. And as you can imagine, that information is very hard to find. But have a look at this. So this is what it typically sells for on the retail shelf. So 13, you know, almost $14 a kilogram, a few outliers there. But yeah, so we could tell the farmers that yeah, the product is 13 to $14 a kilogram on the, on the shelf. So there's a big, yeah, big bump between what the importer gets and then uh, what the retailer sells it for. We could sort of guesstimate that they were then selling it on for about seven or eight dollars a kilogram and then the retailer was then basically doubling it to about that fourteen dollars a kilogram. That's what we could guess, guesstimate to use my words. Um, so yeah, I get a little bit more information about what people get in the chain. The, the big reason for it, well, if you've ever been to Singapore before, it's about seven, close to eight million people in an area about half the size of the DTA or you know, half the size of Toronto, basically. Uh, so land is a premium, uh, which means that a retail space, a wholesale space is extremely expensive to rent. Uh, also, it's a major uh, finance hub of the world. So wages are high as well. Um, so, you know, the, the cost of running a retail store is prohibitively high. Uh, so a lot of that higher margin for the retail is just eaten up in overhead. Uh, so you could say we take the, the, the whole impetus of this project was to find out why is it $14? Well, the end, the end answer to that question is, well, it's expensive to run a retail in, uh, in, uh, in Singapore. So you could say that at the end of this, well, I'll get to the next point maybe in the slide after. There's a little more information about what we looked at as what we call either the, the main cost components or major quality control points. Because particularly for this, I've shown it a different way to say the non-valuating or valuating different attributes. But you can tell without having to go through all of this that it's, it's air freight. So it has to be quick, it's expensive. Those of you who have been in Singapore before know that it's 34, 35 degrees and 75, 80% humidity every day. So typically it's uh, product deteriorates quickly. So without cold chain logistics, you will then get product degraded very quickly and lose, uh, and lose price. Uh, so some of the attributes um, or aspects of the chain that uh, were important. 
But yeah, you can say that, well, okay, that the farmers aren't going to make much money out of this project, out of exporting Singapore, because all of it's all of it's eaten up and overhead by retailers and wholesalers. But but what we did was we understood one important thing, what the market specification was. What do Singapore people actually want in broccoli? The typical market specification for a grocery retailer in Australia for broccoli is a um, a, a head, a broccoli head about the size of my fist, if you can see it, and then about a two inch stem. Asian markets don't want that. They want, they prize the stem as much or even more so than the floret or the head. So we took that information back to the farms and said, look, if you provide us or provide that importer that we work, well, the importers that we contacted and work with for our for our study, if you can provide them with this market specification, then yeah, you're not going to get paid any more, but you're going to sell more, uh, and then you'll you'll cut you'll obviously be, be selling more and making more money out of that rather than um, trying to find ways of extracting margin. Uh, so they did, uh, and now the Lockyer Valley sells a lot more broccoli to Singapore. It's one of their major markets, um, just by basically myself and a bunch of students going into that market and asking simple questions about what consumers want. And we also did a bit of consumer research. So what consumers want and what do you want as a market specification um, and, and matching the two. So um, not all lost there. I think why I like value chains sits a lot in what is shown here, that I'm a business academic. I, I work in a business school. Um, I teach business school students and my research is in understanding business. But looking at the projects I've showed you to to change broccoli, to purify a scallop requires science, it requires marine biology, it requires horticulture, it requires post-harvest management, it requires cold chain logistics, it requires food scientists as well. So I like the fact that I find information that is useful or has implications, I should say, across a whole set of different science areas, not just within one very narrow business segment. Uh, so yeah, I work with soil scientists and, and integrated crop management people and, and post-harvest food scientists. Um, but all in the, under this umbrella of, of value chains. Well, so I always like to finish with, with a couple of questions because I think this frames it well. So, you know, we talked about right at the beginning, you know, we want to have $85 billion worth of agri-food exports and it's not going to happen by producing just more food. Um, it's going to require more food that people want to pay more money for and buy more of in specific markets that are more targeted. And that's going to require collaboration. It's going to require businesses to work together. Um, and I think some of the, there's a slightly, a little bit of fragmentation in the Canadian agri-food sector that you can ask me questions on later that sort of dissuades that to some extent. Um, but yeah, why do we need to collaborate? Because we need to grow markets. Um, and if anything, we're coming out of COVID-19 in, in the coming months and year. And, you know, we have incurred a lot of debt as a nation. Agri-food sector is one of our shining lights, our ability to provide occupations, jobs, taxpayer, taxpayers and basically tax to help the rest of our economy is going to be important. And I think the food sector can do that. We can collaborate all, all over the world. We can work with people all over the world. Um, the world is a small place. Um, and as a country like Canada, where we're very focused, where we are, sorry, where we have been very much focused on being a supplier to our southern neighbour, um, we need to look at it more, more, more markets and more niche markets. And over what activities can we work over? Well, everything, you know, from primary production all the way to the, well, a lot of the studies I do, the impact of those seedlings or the genetics of, say, the, the beef product have a massive implication to what the consumer wants down the end of the chain. So the reverberations along the chain, the systems thinking that goes with that and all the activities that happen in the chain um, are important to this idea of value chains and, and, and boosting our sector. So um, with that, um, I'd like to thank you for listening to me today. Uh, I hope it's been educational and enjoyable and uh, I welcome all questions. Thank you very much, Simon. If anyone Pleasure. has a question, Simon, please uh, rate it in the, the question box. Um, I have a couple questions for you, Simon, to start it off. Please. Uh, first of all, I loved your explanation between uh, the difference between a supply chain and a value chain. Um, that's the clearest I've ever seen it. So thank you for that. I think it made a lot of sense. Um, 
you talked a lot about how, you know, Canada, obviously, we need to increase the value of our products. We know, we all know in the food industry that we're primary producers and we're very good at that. So how, can you expand a little bit on the fragmentation of our industry or how the food industry in Canada can increase the value of our products? Yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, one of the, the Remember, one of the differences I've observed in Canada from, say, some of the other more developed, comparable countries that, that do, obviously, agri-food production. Um, in Canada, we, we have a very, um, uh, the word I'm looking for, a disconnect between primary production, prime, uh, food production, or food manufacturing, I should say, and retailing. Um, where the lines are a little bit blurred in other countries. So we, we, sort of, we sort of put on a pedestal, rightly so, that this is the food manufacturing sector and they make food and here's the farming and then the farmers give the food to give the ingredients and so on and so forth. Um, but there's very little incentive for, say, farmers to go into food manufacturing. Um, most of the incentives of this government policy are around um, maintaining agri-food production. And I'll give an example. So uh, in Ontario, there's a lot of, well, there's vast production of soybeans. Uh, most of them go to animal feed, um, but some go to human production uh, and, sorry, human consumption, I should say. And uh, a lot of it is exported for human consumption. And Japan is one of the major markets where the Japanese then make it into tofu. Um, but there's almost no, if not any, uh, companies in, in Ontario making tofu here and selling it to Japan. There are the odd, but not very many. Uh, most countries, what has happened is that primary producers have had to div diversify the risk of running their business by going into value adding, going into food production. Uh, and in Canada, we have a set of what we call BRM, business risk management tools for farms, which, which give them in effect subsidies and money to keep on operating when things get tough. While some other countries, they haven't had that. Uh, so I think there hasn't been a great incentive, at least for farms to go into food production. And in fact, what I call on-farm value adding is, is, is an area that we could really incentivize, particularly from uh, the federal government perspective. And I think that's the thing because people, particularly consumers in export markets, they want to understand where the food comes from, wh where it is, what it's about. And the best person to tell that isn't a food manufacturer, it's actually, the primary producer, but they're often, often disconnected from that food manufacturing. So I think that's one thing that could be focused on. Okay, that's a good point. I think historically, because we have been primary producers, you know, we're like, you know, we've always been great producers of wheat, for example. Um, do you think moving forward, any government policy, do you know if there's any plans to look at that? Have you been part of any, you know, suggesting this to governments or? Very much so. Um, yeah, last year there was, in fact, let me clarify, yeah, early last year there was a, uh, a Senate inquiry, or a Senate committee, I should say, that's a better word, on value adding uh, for export of agri-food production, and I appeared before that and, and gave a similar type of message, that we do produce great products, um, but they're very much ingredients. Um, one that is in particular of interest to me, which is very complex, is dairy. Um, there has been a boom, particularly in Asia, for infant formula, um, for lactoferrin and other aspects of um, particularly dairy products. Australia, as an example, ex exports fresh fluid milk, not UHT milk, but fresh fluid milk into China. Um, they've had some roadblocks, but it's been, they've worked them out. Um, supply management makes it almost impossible. Um, so we, the, what, what gives me hope is that we have the right raw ingredients. That's the key here. We have the right primary production. We just need to do the next bit, which is actually a little bit easier, to incentivize people and businesses, whether they be primary producers or manufacturing sector, to be more focused on probably those markets that they haven't necessarily had a lot of connection with before. Okay. Now, just recently, in, in this week, and I believe there'll be another announcement today, um, there has been some announcements between uh, 
plant protein ingredients and actually adding to the value chain here in Canada. So value added processing. Is that mm -hmm. a good example of maybe where we're heading or can you think of any other examples in Canadian food that are doing, like are practicing value chain management quite well? Yeah, I think the, the protein, protein industry cluster in, uh, I think it's based in Saskatchewan. Uh, and what they're doing is a good first step. Um, I'm not 100% sure where the markets for these products are focused. I, th I think they're very much North American based, which is perfectly fine. Um, I think that's a good first step. I think we, we have, there is going to be this boom in, in, there has been a boom in plant-based proteins. It's small. I think there's some just recent information that's come out of the US that shows that of all the protein market, plant-based proteins are at 1.5% of the market, uh, even though Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger ever had a big success. Uh, so I think that that's a good first step. Uh, I think, you know, the shellfish is a good example. It's a live product. It's It's been exported for quite some time to long long distances. And I, and I, and I will obviously show my hand in that my experience in Asia is, is, well, my expertise is particularly in Asian markets and those higher value things such as the shellfish, the dairy, um, culinary things like, like tofu are where we could sit at. Uh, there are companies out there that are doing this. They're, they're small. The problem is we don't really hear about them. I think that's a bit of a shame. Um, so I, uh, answering your question, Christy, in a slightly roundabout way, I think what would, what would help us or what would help the Canadian public understand this a bit better is if we had a, uh, a, a media attention to it. Um, we don't really have a, a dedicated agri, agriculture or, or food program in Canada. Um, other countries do. New Zealand does, Australia does, South Africa does. There's, there's, there's programs um, uh, in, on the major networks of other countries that are very heavily focused and their economies are very heavily focused on primary production and we don't quite have that yet. So yet yeah, there are people out there doing some good stuff. We just need to hear their voices. That's a very good point. I have um, a question from Nazir in Halifax. Um, the question is how would you classify COVID mitigation steps? Would this be value added or non-value steps in the supply chain? So the, the the best way to know what is value or not is if it's if it's value based on the needs of the market. So that can be interpreted two ways. So does the consumer value it, or does the buyer in that market? Let's say it's an importer, or a wholesaler, or a restaurant, or retailer, or someone like that. Um, we've seen maybe this relates to something we've seen in the last sort of 48 hours about that China sort of acquiring its ex or importers to provide assurances that they don't get COVID from the food, which we seem to recognize that you can't contract COVID. It's not, it's not transmittable from food. Um, I think in that case, it's, it's more of a standardized COVID protection. I think was, I think that was the question and whether, whether it has it or not, I think is more of a, of a, a standard, a food safety standard. I, I, I think if it's uniform against all foods, it's probably not a value attribute. Um, because you can't really differentiate yourself to some extent. Now, if COVID was heavily transmittable, transmittable via, via food, then I think it'd be a different set of circumstances and situations. Okay, thank you. And I have another excellent question from the audience. Uh, one of the big challenges seen by food manufacturers is the inability to find skilled workers in Canada. Mm. And the Barton report projection, projections also linked uh, the employment shortages as well as part of the problem. How mm -hmm. does value chain theory work and interface with human resources and workforce development? Mm, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So uh, when, when we particularly do our, our analysis, we're looking at where, where are there deficiencies? Where are these wasted activities? And then the, the root cause of many of them are that there are people who didn't know that they had to do this activity or they were doing too much of this activity. So a skilled workforce is uh, highly critical. Um, uh, the uh, report a couple of years ago from the University of Guelph said, you know, there's four jobs for every agri-food graduate, not just in farming, but, but all the way across the, uh, the food supply chain. So we, we struggle to get 
students and most of these people are Gen Z, millennial, early 20s people interested in the agri-food sector and the way that then for their decisions about how they, what programs they want to get to do are done way when they're in high school. So our, our aims are to then focus on getting those high school people, I'm getting a little bit off topic, but yeah, there, there is, we have the skilled people, it's important in, in value chains um, and a lot of it is, um, we have, I think in Canada we we struggle to get people in there because there's a, uh, there's a lack of awareness um, and but we have uh, high quality post secondary institutions not just universities um, but it's linking with them that we seem to um, struggle to do um, but yeah the the human element because chains aren't things they're people as I said you know one of those philosophies was people it's food's, food's not made by people sorry it's made by people running businesses but they're still people. Um, so yeah, a high trained workforce is, is really important. Thank you. And we have time for one last question. And this is a question that I actually had. So someone, <laughs> we're all on the same page, it looks like. What is the best approach to improve collaboration between producers, processors, and consumers? Right. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I, I, uh, I, I tell, at least Talking about the, the the members of the chain first, and so we'll talk about the consumers. But the main main point is the, that value chains aren't for everyone. They're not for every business. The willingness to want to cooperate, to work together, uh, to change the way you do what you do, which you're going to have to do in a in a proper value chain, is not for everyone. So I spend a lot of time when I do what I call talent identifying when it comes to these value chain projects and looking at okay, if we've understood the chain, which I've shown you all the analysis today, well, how do we make it better? It's about finding the right businesses that want to change. A lot of them are particularly young, particularly the own production, a lot of young farmers. Um, the food processing sector I find that I work with that are pretty good. They're always very market focused and understand because they're closer to the consumer than say primary production, which is very dislocated. Um, they do it pretty good. Retailers, um, you know, they get it as well. Um, but finding the right, working with particularly young farmers, um, trying to show them. So what I, what I do is, uh, and this is more of a practical example, is I will get, say, at the end of the research, and you've obviously seen the research, in the research, I'll get some, maybe one or two farmers who are sort of interested in this, one or two food processors that are also, and maybe some retail representatives as well. And we'll do an exercise called walking the chain. So we'll actually go to each level of the chain for whatever chain they're involved with. Obviously, it might even also involve their businesses to get them an understanding of what other levels of the chain actually do. What does a retailer do? It gives them an understanding of obviously what's happening, but it gives them a bit of a appreciation, almost an empathy for what other members of the chain are, or sympathy or for other members of the chain and what they're doing. Um, that really brings people together. Um, it builds trust because trust is really that, that building block. Uh, and that makes it a lot easier when it comes to then working together to build what that consumer wants. So yeah, there's a few activities that we do to help that, uh, but finding the right people is, is, is key. Okay, I have one question related to that. How do you find that some of these uh, producers or processors are coming to you, or how are they finding out about this? Like you said, right. they were a little bit low, but if I, you know, if if I'm a company or I'm a producer, how do I how do I go about contacting you or getting some kind of service to help me with this? Right. So uh, part of that is things like I've done today. I do a lot of talks with 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 uh, commodity groups, um, also organisations like Sipists and, and other retail groups, explaining what this is and, and how it works. And obviously, this this helps as well. Um, I work a lot with OMAFRA and other provincial uh, governments of you know departments of ag and, and fisheries. Um, and their extension service can help, and the people there can help point me in the right direction of people who are interested in this sort of thing because their sort of hands, you know, their, their fingers are to the ground, or, or their ears are to the ground. I should say, not fingers. The ears are to the ground, to the ground of about the what the right people. Um, and then yeah, it, it's a, a lot of what I call KTT on my hand, talking with people, explaining what I do, how it works. Um, Obviously, if you're interested, you know, connect with me. Obviously, my details are there. But um, the University of Guelph also has some resources that we also put up as well. But um, 
yeah, I try to I try to beat the drum as much as I can about value chains, and that sort of helps a lot as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Simon. On behalf of the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology and Food in Canada magazine, we thank you so much for your informative presentation today. In lieu of a speaker's fee, uh, CIFST has made a donation in your name to Food Banks Canada. And I just want to remind everyone that we are hosting webinars every Wednesday until the end of July. And so far I can share the following dates and speakers. On July 8th, there will be a panel discussion with food grads which will be an interactive platform for the industry to attract and retain people in careers in food and beverage. And July 29th, we have Dr. Ricky Yada, who's Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. And we'll be announcing um, speakers for July 15th and 21st shortly. And also some exciting news that uh, CIFST has scheduled um, CIFST Coast to Coast, which is a virtual showcase, and that's gonna be held on October 28th. So everyone mark their calendars. And please watch your email or visit their website for more details. Thank you everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.